Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode. I'm Ricky. And I'm Brittany. And we are Paper Paper Screen. Screen. So, Brittany, what have you been up to? I went and saw the movie 65 with Adam Driver. Oh, my God. Is that good? It was really fun. (gasps) Yeah. It's not like a remarkable movie. It's not something you're going to get like deep messages and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, it's got like dinosaurs. So It's like Back to the Future means dinosaurs right uh no oh <laughs> <laughs> it's like um i don't i i know there's something we could compare it to but i don't have it right now but it's you can tell from the trailer it's just like adam driver he like is manning a ship and it crashes on a planet with dinosaurs and then he has to like get off the planet and him and like a little girl are the only survivors. Is the little girl on the ship with him? Yeah. There's a bunch of frozen people on the ship. Oh, and so it's like alien. Yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> with dinosaurs. It's like Prometheus. And Predator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, it's it's more it was like just really fun. Wow. Cool. I'll have to check that one out too. <laughs> What about you? What have you been up to? Uh, I recently saw The Lion King live production at the Pantages. Amazing. My, my favorite place because it's the only place that I get recognized. <laughs> Somebody called the tabloids. <laughs> TMZ was right up front. That was my first time seeing that like live production. And it's been around for so long. I thought it was a phenomenal experience. So cool. Yeah, I really wanted to go, but I didn't. I can't remember if it was because it was sold out the days I could go or I just didn't want to like spend that much on a ticket. But I've only heard the soundtrack. I heard the soundtrack when I was like in, I was like 16. A friend was playing it and I was like, this is the most incredible music. (laughs) But yeah, I've never seen it. Yeah. I mean, like I love the production design, the set design and the costuming like there's lots of african inspiration this is not a spoiler but like my favorite scene is how they did the stampede oh cool Ufasa death which is like Shit. so cool so i definitely recommend going to see it it's a once in a lifetime opportunity I loved Timon and Pumbaa. <laughs> it's very similar like to the movie version. Like they look exactly alike. That's so cool. I loved it. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, good for you guys. I'm jealous. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to mention a book that I read like last year that's related to uh, the topic of our episode. It's called Memorial by Brian Washington. And you recommended this book to me because it is about a gay interracial couple. But uh, just a little bit about the book. It's about this gay interracial couple they're both kind of in a rocky point in their relationship but one of them has to leave the country to take care of their dad and that's all i'll say about it but it's like really good but hard book for me to read just because i connected with this and sorry (laughs) (laughs) can't wait to see the tv adaptation yeah i think it'll probably be pretty good yeah because it's produced by a24 oh yeah it'll be good oh yeah (laughs) But I guess we could get into our episode. Yes. Today's episode, we have a double feature and the topic is queer. Those two movies are Moonlight and A Single Man. Now, we chose these movies because not because they're similar, but because they're both about queer people struggling in different... Like stages of life. Different stages in life. A lot of tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of hardship. They both are fucking stunning. Yeah, and I feel like a single man is like underrated. It really is. That movie is fucking beautiful. It's like... If you haven't seen either of these movies, definitely go check it out now. Come back to this episode later. But yeah, there's going to be tons of spoilers. I guess we'll start with the first film. Let's 
start talking about Moonlight. So here's a little synopsis about Moonlight for those who have not seen this or need a refresher. This film is about a young African-American man that's dabbling with his sexual identity while experiencing the everyday struggles of his childhood, his teenage years, and eventually his adulthood. So throughout this film, we're seeing different stages of this character's life, this journey. Uh, it's starring Mahershala Ali, who is our new Blade in the MCU. Shut the fuck. I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Did I know that? Girl, it's been old news. Maybe I knew news. that. Maybe I knew that. Naomi Harris, who was in 28 Days Later. Yeah, phenomenal. Love her. Janelle Lene, Trevante Rhodes, Andre Holland, Jarrell Jerome, who was in When They See Us. Have you ever seen that? No, but that's a book series, right? I don't know if it's a book series, but it is based on like the Central Park Five yeah, yeah, yeah. kids. So good. But yeah, this is directed by Barry Jenkins, who did If Beale Street Could Talk. Also written by Barry Jenkins and Terrell Alvin McCraney, who I think did the story because it was originally a play. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Started out as a play, but then decided to be turned into a movie instead. You're the only man that's ever touched me. You're the only one. I haven't really touched anyone since. So I remember this movie was like getting a lot of Oscar buzz at the time. So it was definitely in my radar. I didn't know anything about the movie except like it was just like really good and about like a queer character. It was a gay movie, but I never got to see it in a movie theater. So I watched it at home because I wanted to get ready for the Oscars. And watching it for the first time, I was like, wow, that was like really good. But re-watching it recently, I was like, damn, there was like a lot of stuff that I missed. Yeah, I really liked that movie and I'm glad that it won like Best Picture that year because I saw La La Land and I was like, yep. no, well, thank you. Same, yeah, that was really interesting. I yeah. watched La La Land was another one that I watched like kind of sort of out of spite because people kept talking about it. And you're like, uh, no, thank you. All this singing. <laughs> the first time I watched it, I was like, is this a joke? Like, is some, like what? Well, I don't get it because Ryan, what is his name? Gosling. Ryan Gosling, no offense, God bless you, but he's like terrible at singing. Is, is he not? He's I mean, like, yeah, he's like, the sun's coming out. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Why are we talking about this I don't movie? Know, fuck that movie. <laughs> so I went to, um, I was with a couple of friends and we were going to go see around the same time as Arrival. Oh, yeah. That movie about like aliens and that oh, fucking giant pee. In yeah. The fucking- <laughs> Uh, the redhead lady from Amy Adams. Yeah, it's Amy Adams. So we get to Arc Light, R.I.P. Oh, Arc Light in Hollywood, and they're like, "Oh, it's sold out," and we're like, "Oh," and like part of me was like, "Good," because <laughs> like I thought the movie didn't look good, but like everyone kept talking about how it was good, and like one of my coworkers was like, "It's amazing. It's what Interstellar should have been," and I was like, "Interstellar is one of my favorite movies," and I was like, "Yeah, what the fuck?" So anyway, sold out. Yeah, we're looking at the thing, and and I had seen an interview with Barry on maybe The View or something and I was like would you guys want to go see that Moonlight movie it looks really good and I don't know if they had heard of it before but I was like it looks like really good Yeah. so we went to it we got like you know the first like not the first row up like in the front but the first row usually when you walk in we got like those seats theater was packed it was like oh yeah it was like everyone was at the movies that day I mean you were in Hollywood right yeah oh Busy. It's an arc like Hollywood where like the dome is or was or whatever. So if you haven't been to LA or like not familiar, it's like a very touristy, iconic movie theater situation. Yeah, we saw it and I think all three of us were just like silent after the movie, <laughs> like just kind of sitting there like, okay. Uh. It was like the whale for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, because when I was watching it, like after it ended, I remember thinking like, I've never seen something that encapsulated empathy. Yeah. Like, like, like you can't watch that movie and not comprehend what empathy is or what I don't know if like I'm articulating that the way I want to but so let's talk about the budget okay so the budget's gonna guess what it is 
I'm pretty sure it's low. It's like 11 million. 1.5. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, isn't that It's crazy? an indie film, so. Very. Box office, near 65. Oh. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Hell yeah. I guess we can get right into it. So in the film, there's three chapters to the film, and it's Little, Sharon, and Black. I guess we can talk about Little first. For me... It was the relationship between little Sharon and Juan, that moment that they have at the beach. I think it's the beach. And the scene that stuck out was like when Juan is telling that story about that lady at the bodega or whatever, gave him a nickname and it's like blue. And he says to little Sharon, don't let anyone make that decision for you. You got to decide for yourself. Talking about like his name that was given by that lady. And it kind of foreshadows, like, the future version of Little, because he eventually becomes kind of like Juan at the end. Yeah, and that's where part of the, like, film comes from, is it's inspired by, in the moonlight, black boys look blue. Oh. Like a story or something. The play? Is there a play called that? (laughs) Wait, did you, do we already just talk about that? Oh, my God. I didn't, I didn't say which play it was called. I just know it was, like. But, yeah, it's very, it's, like, yeah, totally. That whole, the whole thing with Juan and, like, getting to meet him and stuff is, like, Sharon, as a little boy, is, like, he's nearly mute. Like, he's so quiet and, like. Yeah. He looks so uncomfortable and i mean his it's just him and his mom and his mom as we'll see throughout the film is like dealing with addiction and she's pretty intense but he meets juan and it's like juan is like the father he needs exactly and juan is just so lovely and and he's with janelle monet who's also just like this fucking perfect person yeah and juan is like what's so great about him is like He's this black guy in Miami who's a drug dealer, and you can have such a distinct idea of who he is. Mm -hmm. But then he's like this person who like cares very deeply for like this stranger. It's this little boy. Yeah. And Juan has so much depth, but it's like he's only doing that job because he has to, which people have a hard time comprehending. Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, no, I don't think anyone would do something illegal and difficult if they didn't have to. Right. It's like- He's a, he has that job out of circumstance. You mentioned that like he's like a father figure. I also took this as like not like a sexual awakening, but like kind of Sharon's awakening to masculinity. Yes. Because yeah. Sharon, he's probably like more on the feminine side and he's bullied a lot by mm-hmm. like the little kids. That's why he's like hiding in that house. Yeah. Um. Like he's there's that whole scene where he's Juan takes him home because they're like here's this random kid and they're giving they're feeding him and he goes what's um at the f word mean rhymes with maggot <laughs> and uh <laughs> what does maggot mean yeah so he, then he says something Juan's just kind of like just like a it's a bad it's word bad to word that, identify like gay people and I think they know that like he's gay because like there's a part where he's like am i a maggot and then janelle monet's like you know if you are or not like she says she like says <laughs> yeah. something nice I nice but kind of like part. yeah she says something whatever and then um, he goes are you a drug dealer and it like you can tell it kills juan yeah it like kills him that sharon knows but that's how kids are they know everything yeah yeah and he just goes my mom's on drugs right like, and clearly the pain of this child is because of that. Do you think, like, Juan is the reason why his mom is the addict? Did she may have gotten those drugs from him or through him? Yes. I think Sharon says, did you sell my mom drugs? Oh. And I can't remember if Juan says yes or he whatever, but there's a scene later. With the mom. With the him. mom and Juan. She's doing drugs and he finds her with, like, some other dude and he's he starts grabbing her and she's like, who the fuck are you? and she's like she's like super high and she's like what are you gonna parent my child now yeah and it's like he's he has no business doing this or anything but that's how much he cares about sharon yeah he's like you can't be doing drugs like you've got this boy to look after even though i'm like the fucking drug dealer like yeah it's really complicated let's talk about that scene the water the swimming i thought that was like such a chill sequence like the music yeah the music it's just it's so peaceful and i think like there's just a lot of metaphors with that like him learning how to swim this is why i thought like there was like some sort of sexual awakening like Mm -hmm. 
through Juan and like little Sharon because he's probably never been touched by someone like this. He's being touched by like this person who's like a father figure. He feels safe. He feels right. protected. And, and I was going <laughs> to say, and they're in the ocean, which is extremely dangerous. This child doesn't know yeah. how to swim. And so he's being the most vulnerable he could possibly be, which is the same as he would be if he were out. Yeah. Like when he decides to come out or whatever. So like, is that part of what you mean by like the awakening? Like, yeah, totally. Because <laughs> like, you know, man. <laughs> no, yeah, totally. I, I think that, it, yeah, it was like uh, so symbolic. Like that that meant a lot to him, him yeah. being taught how to, how to swim. Because, I mean, he's quite literally holding him. Like a baby. Yeah, and like, you know, just everything and like the way that they shot it like the camera's like half in the water it was just really lovely yeah it's like so peaceful and calming it feels like a baptism (laughs) yeah it does (laughs) so at the end of that we see the shot of the mom in the hallway yeah i loved that scene i don't know why it's just like really cool how they shot like the lighting in that because it's like purple I believe it's it's lit like a magenta purple and the mom's wearing a red tank top. Oh, and I wonder if the poster is it's correlating like purple to each chapter. Oh, it probably is for sure now that you say that. I was going to say I did that presentation on women in cinema at work. Yeah. And I talked about the editor of this film, Joy McMillan, and she specifically has I put this quote she had that was like I think when you're editing movies like sometimes you need to just have things be very slow yeah give the audience time to go into the atmosphere and when the, with that whole quote I like played the scene of the hallway because I was like when I read that quote I thought of that scene yeah and she's just like screaming in like silence it's like muted yeah which and is like so powerful it's so powerful and it it's it's like a big moment of trauma for him yeah because he's kind of haunted by that whole yeah because it replays in his head like in like a later chapter i'm not sure if it's like the second one or the third one well it does do it in the third one i don't remember if it's in the second but when he's an adult it does yeah by the end of this chapter i think we can say that mahershala was either arrested or dead i really don't remember because i all we see is like the police yeah. sirens. So I was like, oh, he he's either dead or in prison. We don't know. Yeah. But we don't see him in the next chapter. <laughs> Mahershala literally got an Oscar for like 10 minutes of the movie. <laughs> But I will say, second time, like I went through and watched a bunch of scenes, but I was like, he is phenomenal in this. I mean, he's a, he completely transformed into a new person because he always plays like the sophisticated businessman or like. Really? Yeah. You don't think so? Before or after Moonlight? Because I feel like this was like the first movie that I've ever seen him in. Oh, this is not the first movie I've seen him in. This is, okay, this chapter, before we go into the next one, we do get an introduction of Sharon's best friend kevin yeah chapter two is sharon and sharon's like a teenager now right yeah so this chapter i feel like i connected with this because you know being a teenager and gay like not knowing anything about sexuality being confused like i feel like that's just like that's something that i connect with is like sharon kind of dealing with his like you know sexual confusion at that age And it's already a really hard age. Yeah. And he's still being bullied, being called a maggot. Yeah. This is, and this is like, it's like when he has kind of his like transformation into masculinity. Like, oh, yeah. Like, like the so- social pressure, masculinity right. or whatever. The social pressures of being a man. Like, fight back. Yeah. Manhood. Like, yeah. So, Kevin, his best friend, kind of sticks up for him. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's a scene where, like, we see teeny Sharon <laughs> has a little wet dream about his best friend. Uh-oh. Who hasn't? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, this is why I said I connected with this a lot yeah. because I have definitely had wet dreams about guys in yeah. high school. And I always wondered what what was going on with me. Like all the guys in my class were like, "Oh, boobs and ass." Like, I was like, Boobies. "What?" I was like, "Ew." 
<laughs> Nobody knew that I was like gay though. Really? I mean, not that they were like vocal about it. They weren't calling me a maggot. Right. I was very um in the closet, I will say. And yeah. growing up in Minnesota. <laughs> growing up in St. Charles, St. Charles, Minnesota. Little Shits Creek. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It, that's really funny. Yeah. So, you know, going to PE as a little teenager, teeny Ricky. It was kind of like a weird moment for me, you know, not going to lie. I did stare at some people, but it's hard to not stare when you have to take showers with guys. <laughs> Gotta say, you guys are learning a lot about me today. <laughs> I'm a little peeping Tom. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but yeah, back to Moonlight, though, like we do eventually see like Kevin and Sharon on the beach, which is like a very iconic moment. Mm-hmm. In the moonlight, black boys look blue. Well, you know, because they're in the moonlight. Like in the moonlight, black. Oh, at the beach. <laughs> I was like, "What are you saying?" I thought <laughs> I thought you were still about to say something. <laughs> oh, you're saying in the moonlight, black boys look blue. Yeah, and they're having interesting well i think kevin's done it before because kevin's like clearly like bi curious and like more he's like an extrovert and more exploratory and like comfortable in his own skin where sharon is like he's like shy introvert yeah and closed off yeah he hasn't because he hasn't really had like a, a safe foundation to stand on so he's just you know and whereas like kevin's just like i am who i am and like i do what i do and yeah uh yeah so in this scene we do get the little handy we yeah we get a handy <laughs> <laughs> oh lord <laughs> we get a handy kevin Sharon. gets a little handsy with sharon and this is the scene that i was like oh <laughs> whoa <laughs> Because I was like, um, they're like teenagers. Like, I can't believe they're showing this. But it's not like we're seeing a lot, but we just know what's happening. I like how they shot that, though. Yeah, it was really, I really like how they shot that. Yeah. Because it's like a lot of close-ups and then like like reactions to mm-hmm. like their face. Yeah. I saw an interview with Barry talking about like the significance of like the beach and just like how that was like his spot growing up and everything. What was the gayest thing that you've done? And have you done poppers? <laughs> no, I haven't done poppers. Maybe, like, if I ever go to, like, England, I will. <laughs> Why England? <laughs> They're, like, huge there. Oh. Yeah. Um. I mean, you can answer yes or no. Have you done something gay in your life? Yes. Love that for you. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I mean, you're just making me think about how sexual middle school is. <laughs> Because he is in middle school, right? I would say middle school, yeah. Because middle school, thirteen. Like, that's like when everyone's like, that's yeah, yeah. And oh my god, and like all the guys, so many guys I knew would like touch each other's dicks and like put their mouths on each other's dicks and stuff at church overnights. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. The guys would do that? They sure would. The quote unquote straight guys. Wow. Just, we need you know, to call. Oh, them. Put your mouth on my dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Did you do this type of thing with anyone in middle school? I've never done a handy in middle school. I never had any gay sexual experience. Okay. Which is kind of sad because I I feel like a lot of gay people have experienced, you know, doing gay stuff back then. I don't know. I always hear stories like people coming out like early in high school. I'm like, I could never because I was scared of one, my dad (laughs) and him finding out. Right. But yeah, like my best friends growing up didn't even know really until like college i mean i didn't even come out until college you know yeah i know (laughs) Brittany knows all about this yeah i came out to her on facebook (laughs) well like i knew you were gay i know you would be like are you gay no no i i go you said something and i go so do you like any guys and you were like lol no i'm like okay or like do you like any girls do you like any guys like i tried being really casual (laughs) and you always said you always said no and then like a couple months into things and then i was like Brittany, i have something to tell you and you're like i already knew that (laughs) um 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, though, is, like, so I'm, like, I would, like, mostly identify as, like, demisexual, which I didn't even know I was until I was, like, 28 or 29. I didn't even know what it was. And then, like, someone explained to me, and, like, I had, like, a that soul raven moment. My, like, whole life flashed before my eyes, and I was, like, oh. Because I don't feel sexual attraction when, like, I look at people. And so if we were together and you weren't announcing, like, she's hot, I'd love to like sleep with that woman. I wouldn't expect you to say those things. So I wouldn't necessarily notice. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like maybe that's why your friends didn't like they just maybe they're all demisexual. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's like under the asexual umbrella. But you're not like mm-hmm. you're not sexually attracted to people. But if you make a connection like an emotional connection, then you are you like become and like have it. And it's like, you know, it's like a spectrum for everyone. So it, it doesn't mean like you never see someone and think whatever actors a lot of times i'll develop sexual attraction because i get emotional connection because of watching them play a character play a character yeah, yeah. the first time i saw kate blanchett i wasn't like she's hot but now i'm like oh my god she's, she's gorgeous and that's because she continues to play like queer characters i know she's a queer <laughs> legend <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. it's just kind of interesting. But yeah, middle school is just like such a trip. Yeah. It sucked. <laughs> like ultimately I'd say it's horrible. Dude, Sharon, this is like he gets into fights. Yeah, he's getting and betrayed by Kevin because Kevin is like fucking told by one of his bullies to like get to like beat Sharon up. And he does. That's what happens. And then Sharon fights back. You know, he has this like epiphany. He's like, I'm not going to be like this wimpy kid anymore. I'm going to fucking man up and show you. Do not fuck with me. And he basically beats the shit out of his bully. He takes like a fucking he takes, chair. Like, he comes out of the bathroom, just like waltzes into this classroom, grabs a chair, bam! And like the kid just, <laughs> I mean, is a kid unconscious? Like, Yeah, well, he's like still beating him too. I think he's just still going at it. And then the cops come and that's the end of chapter two. And Kevin like watches him get taken by the cops. Yeah. So Sharon is in his 30s now. He's like buff. He looks like 50 cents. I was just going to say that. I was just, that's what I was just going to say. He I was like, he just looks like 50 cents. 50 cents. Yeah. So I didn't realize this, but Kevin actually gives him the name Black in the second chapter. Oh, that's interesting. So in the third chapter, he is Black. Why does he name him Black? I don't remember, but I just remember that like he kept calling him Black in. Mm-hmm the first chapter or second chapter and sharon's just like why do you keep calling me that and he's like because that's your name and it kind of goes with like you know juan's story of that woman um saying like i'm gonna call you blue and he's like don't ever let anyone make that choice for you you have to choose it so basically he chose to go with that name black oh it's just very ironic I thought the last chapter was kind of like... It goes by quick. It goes by really quick and it feels like so open-ended that like you wanted more to happen. Totally. It like It's like we jump ahead and he's kind of... He's like Juan. Yeah. But like ultra masculine almost. And so you kind of see like the life he ended up... Uh, you could say choosing. You could say like he didn't have a choice because he uh, kind of like y- you learn like his mom hasn't gone sober until he's an adult now and she's at a facility. Oh, yeah. And that's a whole thing. And yeah, he's so clearly, like, he wakes up from the nightmare. He has PTSD from, obviously, from, you know. That hallway scene. Yeah. (laughs) And yeah, and whatever else. I mean, remember when she, like, chases him down for when she's like where's the money kept she like just i mean completely freaks out and he's like that was that's when he was in middle school yeah yeah it's just i don't know and so he goes and sees her and she apologizes but Mm -hmm. it's like what's he supposed to do just be like okay thanks mom bye but yeah and he's he's this like really really tough looking tall black guy yeah really masculine but he's having nightmares about his mom do you know what she's yelling at him in the hallway maggot Oh, so is that why he had asked specifically, like, been like, hey, what does this mean to Juan? Because that was probably the first time he... That is so fucked. That probably is supposed to be the first time he's ever been called that or heard that, and it's from his mom. So Uh, no comment. No wonder his mom is, like, a huge part of his, like, trauma, his Mm -hmm. characteristic. But anyways, that scene in the diner, like, did you notice, like, the, the sound of the waves... He hears the sound of the waves that Mm. reminds him of the moment on the beach. 
oh man yeah and then him and kevin like hang out at his place yeah. kevin's place yeah and that's when he's like that was the first time like anyone has ever touched me that's the only time oh that's the only correct me bitch <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole thing is like his character from being a the small child we get introduced to little to being you know black he is kind of constantly in isolation it's really sad I really wish that they continued on with that story because I would have liked to see how it went down after that. Because it just was like, okay, he's confessing kind of like, we don't really hear from his side of the story. Right. We're just assuming like, oh, I'm gay too. It's not really explained. Yeah, I that same Chris Stuckman or whatever, his review, he had such an interpretation that he was like talking about from when they're young to even adulthood, like Kevin wants Chiron to be himself. Yeah. And like how as like these grown men when Chiron is finally like saying it out loud and Kevin is like, he must be thinking how proud he is of him or yeah. something. But I didn't necessarily interpret it that way. But I again I, I didn't rewatch the movie in full so i should to see if like i catch on that or if i th i think otherwise but i wanted to shout out a channel called sage sage's reign on youtube they gave like a really nice like overview of the film and they said like as black men we are still worthy of tenderness of love you can still be blue even if you spent all of this time denying it mm -hmm. and saying blue is could be like is like representative of like soft yeah you know Oh, I just some something that I thought was really interesting. So, like I mentioned, Joy McMillan's the editor. Um, she was the first Black woman to be nominated for Best Editing at Oscar. Oh. Mm -hmm. 2016. And her, Barry, and then like a bunch of other people. Well, they all went to FSU together. Full Sail University. <laughs> Florida State University. Oh, Florida but close. State. <laughs> <laughs> same, same state. Yeah, they all went to school together. That's cool. And I was like, that is so dope. Um, and she edited Zola. Oh. Yeah. When I gave that presentation about this editor, I like showed all of like her big fields and I was like, she has the most incredible career. Good for her though. Yeah. We didn't even get too deep into like Naomi Harris's performance and, and her addiction and stuff, but I would say that she's so good that that's part of the reason it's like kind of too hard to watch too frequently because it's like whoa yeah yeah i mean the the film is just i mean it's fucking one best picture it, it is like that was i think that was a one other than like the fact that the film is so good at capturing pain and like real life mm -hmm. it the camera work was like when i was seeing it i remember like there's this shot one is like standing with like another dealer, I think. And like the camera is circling them as they're having a conversation. Yeah. I remember like being in the theater being like, yes, cool. Fuck you. Like <laughs> the that, cinematography of it. The cinematography <laughs> of it all. Yeah, but no, really, I mean. And then the editing, I think the editing is kind of what makes this movie what yeah. it is. Okay, I have to apologize. I've been saying Sharon's name wrong because I've been thinking of Sharon as in Ram Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Correction. His name is Sharon. All right. Well, I guess we'll move on to our next film. Yeah. A Single Man. Welcome back. So we're going to be talking about A Single Man. For those who don't know about this film, it's based on a book. This film takes place in 1960s Los Angeles, and it follows an English professor who is just really struggling with life and like coping with the loss of his boyfriend who passed away a year earlier in this film. And it's just really sad. It's starring Colin Firth, Julianne Moore, Nicholas Holt, and Matthew Good. Directed by Tom Ford, fashion designer. Mm -hmm. Written by Tom Ford and David Skears. Based on the novel by Christopher Isherwood. So you had told me about this film because I watched it around the time of like film school. And you were like, you need to watch this movie because you're gay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Listen, you're gay. You got to watch this. <laughs> yeah. I think I watched it because it was when I was doing my degree in cinematography. I saw a scene somewhere or some maybe my professor talked about the cinematography, but that's why I watched it. And then I and then I was like, oh, my God, this movie is incredible. And yeah, like, you know, you had to watch it. Right. Yeah, dude, that wasn't this like 2012. I want to say 2010. Even longer than I thought. Yeah. You told me to watch this and I watched it and I was like, this is such a beautiful movie, but it's like so heavy, just like Moonlight. <laughs> There's just like a lot of heavy themes, but the cinematography is like so beautiful. Ugh. And it makes sense because Tom Ford is like, you know, he's a fashion designer. So think about how detail oriented and critical he is. Yeah, it and- almost feels like a fashion film. It does. Because yeah. of the time period, everyone's outfits are so on brand with that time period. Yeah. It feels commercially, but like. Totally. It just feels like a a Tom Ford portfolio. (laughs) Yeah, because I will say there's like watching it recently so I could take notes. I was like, you know, Colin's suit looks a little too good. Yeah. It like it fits too nice. He's a professor. Like, come on. And even like Julianne Moore's outfit, too. Mm -hmm. It's so to that time. Yeah. And like the hair, too. Oh, yeah. Like everyone's makeup was like it was like so good. So is that what you really think of for these years? You think Jim was just some kind of some kind of substitute for real love? Hmm? Jim was not a substitute for anything. Do you understand? And there is no substitute for Jim anywhere. And by the way, what is so real about your relationship with Richard? He left you after nine years. Jim and I were together for 16 years, and if he hadn't died, we'd still be together. The hell is not real about that. What's the budget on this? The budget was seven million, and the gross box office was 25 million. 25 million? I mean, that's not that much. Yeah, it's not as like much of a jump as Moonlight. It probably didn't get like any Oscar buzz. That's why like no one has seen this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like Moonlight was like this kind of quote unquote underdog. That yeah. was like this very like this indie, emotional, like riveting movie or whatever. Whereas a Single Man is kind of like highbrow art house. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I think a, not a lot of people would like necessarily see this and go, ooh. I want to watch that (laughs) yeah this movie was like hard for me to watch just because it was like about depression and like his journey pretty much like him wanting to kill himself over like his lover I mean it's tragic but like what's devastating is that like he was never able to go to the the funeral so he never got to mourn and like get his peace yeah so I see why like this character is like struggling yeah and like i think they've been together for like seven years and his partner dies in the accident when he's visiting his family back home where like pennsylvania or something and like he has their dogs Mm -hmm. like hello like this is crazy Mm -hmm. and yeah he just gets a phone call that's like oh hey i think from what could have been his brother-in-law i think that's who called to tell him yeah and you're just like what throughout the film because you know obviously he's kind of it's like the last week he's planning on being alive or whatever he's like we get shown all these different flashbacks of their time together and like the meeting was like so romantic and like a dream Mm -hmm. you know like all of these flashbacks it's like you know when you have like a breakup or something and you you think about like all the great stuff like starts like flashing through your mind and like you think like that's the only time that'll ever happen in my life and he's a gay man in the 60s so it's reasonable that he would be like well that was it you know he's from the uk right or yeah uh no england yeah england yeah him and and his character is and so is julianne moore's character (laughs) not convincing (laughs) that's for sure (laughs) fix me a joke oh oh, george (laughs) (laughs) okay before we jump ahead i do want to talk about that opening credit scene where he's like swimming underwater oh, right. it's like super cool yeah and it kind of reminds me of like get out oh yeah yeah the sunken but place it's metaphorically it's different met- yeah yeah but i thought that was really cool and like the the car wreck scene where he sees like his mm. lover but like the snow falling 
It's so pretty. Yeah, it is so pretty. I'm like only going to talk about the cinematography. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, the, well, the cinematography is kind of like what makes this movie what it is. Yeah. Like if it didn't look this stunning, I don't know how I would have felt about the film. Right. I would have been like, boring. <laughs> I mean, it really built every atmosphere yeah it felt like you were in that time period because the way it was shot because it was shot on film the desaturated tones and then the saturated yeah like when he's outside with that one guy the like nicholas holt oh no like the very james dean guy yeah yeah mexican james dean (laughs) and there's like this poster of a woman yeah it's like is it hitchcock's it looked like something like that yeah i love that scene yeah like there's so many shots like that where even like that yeah that first time watching it i was like wow cool yeah but my favorite shot in the film i feel like it's gonna surprise you i'm gonna guess okay guess it's the little girl Shut the fuck up. (laughs) Wait, did I tell you this? I feel like you did. Oh, okay. When he's in the bank? Yeah. Yeah, so he's like fixing his shoe and the little girl who's his neighbor walks up Yeah. and and the floor is reflective so he sees her, you know, her little shoes and he, it's, you move like at his pace, kind of the slow motion, like Mm -hmm. looking up at her and she's wearing, the colors are so intense and she's wearing this beautiful blue. It's like a tealish blue. Like Tiffany blue. And she's just this little kid just looking at him. But like when I, and like the way he looks at her is like, so he's like so inspired. And it's, it's this kind of like, cause he's having, that's what I think it is. is it, he's choosing to die, but now he's having these moments of like, where he's like alive. Right. You know what I mean? So that this child that represents opportunity, innocence, like curiosity, like, she, you know, and it, she like embodies all these different things and he, him just seeing her and she's just has this very unfiltered converse, you know, like a child. Yeah. What does she say to him? She says, my dad says you're light and you're loafers. For those who don't know what light in the loafers means, it's like an old saying. Basically, you're gay, you're girly pop. And I didn't know that. (laughs) So guess who that little girl is? Oh my God, who? Do you know? No, I don't know. You're going to be like, oh my God, because it's going to come full circle. Ryan Simpkins, who is the sister of Ty Simpkins in The Whale. Whoa. (laughs) Right. Full circle. Oh. Yeah, so sh- she's like his older sister. That's crazy. I think that was really, I thought that was really cool. That is cool. I had no idea. I know. But yeah, I really liked that scene. And any time, any time where like the colors do saturate mm-hmm. on screen, you can kind of feel with his character. Because, you know, we're living in this like desaturated world. It just represents like his like mood. Yeah. And yeah. his depression. Right. But then little things like spark his it like enlightens him yes and it's just like little things like the lipstick yeah that actress i forget her name those other scenes where like he sees nicholas holt oh my god i gotta talk about that yes oh my god (laughs) but what were you gonna um just i mean just his whole fucking character when like he meets him at like the little like beach cabana Uh uh-huh and he's he literally looks like the elf in the rudolph movie (laughs) Like he's got, he's like way too like cute or something. He does look a little boyish. He does. Like he's got like very sun kissed skin, like when you're a kid and like, you know, you get that glow. And his hair is very like kind of sweep to the side, like bang, yeah. bang. The blue eyes. And then he's got this like, it looks like a cashmere sweater. It is. Yeah. Like he just looks so iconic. I guess. This is the first time I ever knew who Nicholas Holt was. I never saw. Uh, what's that movie about a boy you never yeah he was really little in them so like him in- growing up i was like who is this man he's like really cute and i was like okay in my 20s when i watch this so yeah i'm gonna be attracted to fucking white boys <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's a he plays a bad boy a lot too. I don't know if you've noticed that because he was in Skin. The menu. <laughs> he's so funny in that. But back to the movie, mm-hmm. Nicholas Holt. He was a hottie in that. I was gonna say like Colin's performance in this whole film, all of the scenes where he doesn't say anything or his like he's so he's so expressive, he's so good. He's not gay, right? No, he often plays gay characters like Kate Blanchett. <laughs> Yeah, I I think he was really good in this too. 
the way that he like treated his fucking maid though i was like you're kind of a bitch <laughs> but he he has that last kind of scene with her though right about the bread yeah doesn't he say something really nice though you've been good to me just kidding i don't know <laughs> he he says something like i i'm sorry i'm a pain like you've always been so wonderful and he like says some nice shit to her i don't remember what uh, it is he's just but... trying to save his ass because he was such a bitch to her well yeah he had... I told you not to put the bread in the freezer <laughs> He has all these like moments like when he's talking to that secretary and he's like, yeah, you look beautiful today. Just not yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He like starts like you look beautiful or you're like your hair looks greater. It's a great sweater or some shit. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. He starts having these like, yeah, that kind that kind of like um, you sh- you're not inhibited, you know. Should we talk about Julianne Moore and George and Charlie's relationship? Yes. I was like, were they lovers? Does she like him? What's the deal? Mm-hmm. I was thinking the same thing because like, she she says something to him like, don't you just imagine like us having kids and blah, blah, blah. Like she's like imagining herself with him. Yeah, I don't remember. I just thought it did seem like she wanted his dick the whole time. <laughs> And to drink. <laughs> well, she's really lonely and bored because her husband died. And they're both from, Eng- you know, they're both British, kind of like fish out of water. She makes a comment to him that one night they're having dinner where she's like, can you imagine? We could we could we could just go back to like England yeah, and, and then, he's like, like live, live our lives together <laughs> like a married couple. And he's like, oh, I could never go back there. Like, <laughs> I'm in L.A., baby. I mean, yeah, she's kind of like that cliche, like, 1960s housewife that, like, gets kind of like, don't worry, darling. She gets dressed in the nines every morning and then just, like, kind of does Yeah, her does her makeup <laughs> and then, like, has a cocktail. Yeah. And then has a cigarette. Like, okay, bitch, that's all you do? She's, like, the messy drunk friend or, like, mm-hmm. the messy drunk beard. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Because she's always, like, fix me a gin and tonic. Yeah. <laughs> But her British accent is terrible. Her British accent is terrible. I mean, <laughs> have you gone mad? She was like, George, why don't we move back to England and have some cheap of our own? Dude, her house is so nice, though. I know. Both but of their she, houses. Yeah. Remember his heads. fucking bathroom? No. Remember when he's taking a shit and watching his neighbors? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like watching that and I'm like, it's really interesting that Tom Ford decided to have a scene where this guy's like taking a shit. It was written in the book. I know, (laughs) but still, I was just like. Okay, but Charlie's house, she has a bunch of plants in that hallway. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm like, you got enough plants, bitch? Like, (laughs) forest. She's like walking. There's some really great scenes that are like pretty heavy. We know that he's like dealing with his lost lover and right. the moments where he plans to like shoot himself. Like he's like laying on the bed trying to like position what's the best way to What's shoot? the most aesthetic way? Yeah. To blow my brain out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's just like kind of triggering. Cause he does it multiple times. He brings the gun to his office right which like that didn't age well (laughs) yeah what did you think about the flashback where we get to see how they met i liked that but also like is colin firth supposed to be like younger because he's he looks the same age because they met seven years ago yeah it's just seven years but still Colin Firth looked like the same age. Uh, that was the only issue yeah. I had. Because I was like, uh, he doesn't look that much younger, but he does. His boyfriend? Well, maybe because he's like the younger one in the relationship. Yeah. And we, I mean, we're seeing him in uniform. Maybe that like made him look young. I Either just remember way. some woman appears and she's like drunk and like trying to take that no that's that's he's in his uniform Uh she's like want to buy me a drink or something and he just looks at colin they literally just met like exchange names and he goes i think i'm taken i I thought that was like so cute like so romantic like just because like they did a really good job showing like kind of letting you imagine what it felt like for george right because i'm sure george i mean like a lot of people are like looking for that that great love or whatever and it's like this young handsome navy man 
Is yeah. he Navy or Air Force or something? Navy, I think. Yeah. Because he's got, I think they wear white. Yes. Yeah, you're right. And he's just like this young, vibrant life, big blue eyes. And Colin, you can tell, is always kind of like the tortured writer kind of vibes or whatever he is. Yeah, light in the loafers. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can just segue into the ending. They have this scene on the beach where like they're running in the water. I thought that was a cute moment too because George is having this like having his little enlightenment Mm -hmm. with this boy. Right. And it's kind of reminding him about like that time with his lover. It's almost like he's kind of like getting out of that depression mode. Yeah, that's what I thought. I got like the vibe that because, yeah, there was obviously like parallels to him and his him and Jim meeting. But also I thought Nicholas's character, he was so like young and curious and like naive that I thought it kind of reminded George like there is life and there's Jim may be gone, but there's so many people out there. There's so many like opportunities. Like, I don't think he was interested in this kid at all. That's not what I'm trying to say. Just more like I was once this kid. And there is so much and like just kind of gave him like hope, I guess. Like there was something from this kid that kind of reminded him of himself. Yeah. Like that time when he was young and free and free spirited. I was just thinking, is Nicholas Holt like the guardian angel? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, because he's wearing white. Yeah. The guardian angel. But yeah, like this whole time he is kind of being distracted by Nicholas Holt and it's kind of preventing him from suicide. Yeah. And he quite literally does. Because do you remember what he does? You know how like Collins takes him home and he's like, here, like whatever. So Nicholas takes the gun and falls asleep with it under a blanket. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, is he doing that to like keep the gun away from George? Oh, is he doing that because he doesn't want to get like raped or something like what is this what does this gun thing symbolize this is at the house right his mm-hmm. house and he's sleeping on the couch yeah like did george ever say i'm i want to kill myself or anything like that that would like no that's why i'm like is he the guardian angel because he's taking the gun away does george take the gun back yeah he like sees part of the gun under the blanket and he like lifts the blanket takes the gun puts the blanket back down and then he goes to his room and he kind Kind of is, you know, because he's like talking to the audience, but he's like, I'm not going to kill myself. Yeah. Yeah. But then something happens. (laughs) And just like that. (laughs) Yeah. And then he um, he fucking dies. What a way to go. The guardian angel came and was like, you don't need this gun because it's going to happen anyways. Naturally. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. I just didn't. I was like, I might be wrong. But I got the impression that Nicholas Holt, it was like, hey, like, low key, I'm gay, you're gay. I want you to, like, kind of, like, be my mentor. But then when he slept with the gun, I was like... Let us know in the comments. Yeah, Tom Ford. Shout out to Tom Ford. (laughs) Let us know what's going on there. Um, I was going to say, we talked so much about the cinematography, but we didn't name the cinematographer. Edward Grew? Grau? Edward Grau. So Edward Grau, he was a cinematographer for that movie Passing about the, oh, yes. she's like a light-skinned yeah. black girl that fits in with all the, yeah. the white people. I haven't seen it, but I wanted to. What's Tom Ford doing? Like, is he going to do another movie? I feel like he's like, he's not like a... Because he's retired from fashion as far as I'm aware. Like, he still owns his brand, but I don't think he's like doing shit. I was going to say, so Tom Ford, background on why he made this. Tom Ford was shopping scripts and rights and nothing was speaking to him. But then he remembered reading A Single Man when he was 20 and working as an actor in LA and how the book touched him. He thought George was a great hero. And he said that the film has the global shared experience of isolation, which makes sense because depression, depression's very isolating. And Moonlight has that. Yeah. To circle back to Moonlight. I think he's just one of those directors that like, uh, I'll make a movie if I feel like it. He's already got a big name for himself. Like he really doesn't need to make films. He's an artist. I believe like he only creates art. Right. He's not going to just do it. Yeah. It's not like all these other like Hollywood directors who like have to make a movie like every year like Steven Spielberg. But yeah, like Tom Ford, he's just like... 
He's, he's an artist, like David Cronenberg. Yeah, <laughs> they should pair up. Yeah, which if you, if you're not like familiar with Tom Ford, other than you know fashion and shit, his follow up to this was Nocturnal Animals with Amy Adams, and Nocturnal Animals is also really good. But Nocturnal Animals, it's shot really beautifully as well, and it's a crazy story. But yeah, he's very talented, and I'm also yeah. just when I found out, oh, he, in his early twenties, he was working as an actor in L.A. I'm like, who? Is this guy okay and then you're like a huge designer like how'd that happen like that's all those are like two very difficult industries to break into yeah unless you're, you're a, a psychopath <laughs> <laughs> i was a psychopathic nepo baby shout out to nepo babies yeah i agree like tom ford is like really talented artist i wish he made more films because you know nocturnal animals was like really good i think i like this one more just because it like focused on like a gay character mm -hmm. and it's prettier and it's prettier just like the time period too like i liked the 1960s era and colin fur is yeah. really great great He's performance. beautiful yeah He's, he looks like a puppy dog too do you have any final thoughts I think A Single Man is a really beautiful film. It's definitely like if you're feeling like you're going through depression, I think it's good to watch because you'll see someone who is feeling the same thing that, you know, like I said, the global shared experience. And I personally think that's helpful when you're feeling those feelings because you're kind of reminded like other people feel this. It comes and goes. Yeah. I was just going to say, I wonder if Tom Ford has a little kink. Because, like, you know how George is taking a shit in this movie? The one, like, bad guy, hillbilly, whatever, in Nocturnal Animals is, like, has an outdoor shitter. He's yeah. also taking a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Dude, that part's so gross. It shows yeah. him wipe. <laughs> <laughs> well... That is Moonlight and a Single Man. Brittany, where can we find you? You can find me at humble underscore book underscore review. <laughs> and you can find me on my less active account, Brittany underscore Gusto on Instagram. <laughs> Ricky, where can we find you? You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at some call me underscore Ricky. And if you liked this episode, please follow us on Instagram. Give us a good review on all of, you know, Spotify, Spotify, or Apple, Apple Podcasts. all that shit. Yeah. So YouTube. make sure you subscribe everywhere so you never miss an episode, but also really want movie suggestions. So tell us. And on that note, till next time, bye! bye.